Did that work? Am I on, Lori? There we go. All right. Uh, welcome to worship on this, was this the 11th Sunday after Pentecost? Yeah, 11th Sunday after Pentecost. Thank you for being here. A couple of announcements. Um, I think some of you have heard already, but we want to extend our condolences to the Probst family. Um, Ann and Jane's cousin, Todd Probst, passed away early yesterday morning. Um, if you know him, you know he's been battling some significant health issues for a long time, and he definitely put up a fight, but uh, no announcement yet as to a memorial service or anything here and maybe late, later in the week or next week, but um, just stay tuned. If we, um, and Jane, if you'll, if you'll let the office know, we can, we can put out a phone tree when, when you know when the service is, so, um, but for now, we just, we just don't know, so, uh, so please keep that family in your prayers. Um, and also, as far as prayers go, uh, I've been talking this morning to a couple of people. It looks like uh, Charleston, South Carolina is about to get pounded with some epic rain from a hurricane coming in. So let's pray for their safety as they go through that. Um, so drawing your attention to the announcements in the bulletin. Oh, there's one that's missing. Um, it is in the, the Miller's mic, if you've picked up your Miller's mic, but we neglected to put it in the, in the bulletin, and that is the Friday Dinner Fellowship. So that will be this coming Friday, and it will be at El Paso on 127. And if you would like to be a part of that, please contact Alice by Thursday. Um, she would prefer it if you call her by noon so that she has time to call the restaurant, make the arrangements, set up the, the reservation and all that. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so, okay. Um, let's see. A couple of other announcements. Just please do look through those. Uh, upcoming grandparents luncheon, we're going to have a sign-up sheet for that. Um, we are having... Um, Bible study tomorrow night. Uh, Tuesday will be a Women of the Church social. Jan, do you want to say anything about that? Tuesday is 6.30 over in the parish hall. It's the Women of the Church general meeting. So all ladies are invited. We're going to have some uh, ice cream and some desserts for that and check out the new flooring over there. So come join us Tuesday at 6.30. Excellent. Does they need to bring anything, Jan? No. Okay. Just show up and eat and be uh, social. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, also, I, I, I hope you heard it in the phone tree and it is in your bulletin. Um, I'm going to do a pulpit swap with Vicar Rebecca next week. So you get to have her instead of me. Um, now, because she's not yet ordained, she can't serve communion. And she has a standing uh, arrangement with the next closest church in the NALC to her, which is only about 10 minutes away. And they do a pulpit swap once a month. Well, that pastor's not available during August. So, um, so they asked me, and I said, yeah, I think she's been away long enough. Y'all would like to see her again. I hope that was a good call. So um, otherwise, the service will be uh, as anticipated, but you'll get a shorter and less boring sermon. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think... Oh... So, um, so I mentioned the storm in Charleston. It is hurricane season. And that means uh, it'll be one more um, time that our uh, flood bucket and disaster response warehouse will likely be emptied. So um, this is an ongoing need. And uh, this, this congregation has demonstrated that this is something that we have a passion for. And... Um, Obviously, it's something that is always in need, and these resources are always put to good use. So I would just ask you to continue, uh, right? There, the, uh, I believe the list of what we typically need is in the bulletin this week. It should, yeah, on page seven. It should be also in your newsletter, but um, if you feel called to just put together one bucket, put together one bucket, bring it to the church. If you feel called to buy 
one thing that can be put in many buckets, like I'm going to go buy a dozen bottles of bleach or whatever that is, we'll take that too. Whatever you feel you can or would like to contribute that would go to that effort, we can use it, okay? We can put it in the warehouse, they can build buckets with it, or we can take completed buckets, whatever. Um, but it's going to be needed very soon. We just we are on the heels of a of a previous disaster in the Midwest, and now, you know, hurricane season kicks up from September to or August to November. So, I I, I don't know. We don't know how many of these more of these we're going to have, but the forecast right now think, set, tells us that Charles the Charleston area is going to need this stuff. So, um, so please consider contributing to that. That about cover it, Tony. Action team. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So those of you who can't hear what Tony and Wendy just said, let me just summarize it this way. If you have an available Thrivent action team because you're a Thrivent customer, that's that $250 mini grant, call Tony and Wendy and they'll direct you to how, because we can't have six people doing multiple Thrivent action teams all in the same thing. So, but we can figure out ways to use it for this. So call Tony and Wendy and they'll help you work through it if, if that's how you want to contribute because that's also very useful. I don't know what you're trying to tell me. Or you can put it in an offering envelope and designate it for the, for the um, disaster response fund. So, okay. Are there any other announcements that I need to highlight for the purpose of, or for the good of the church family? Mandy? Okay, yep. So your, Miller, your August Miller's mics are in the back, and the annual reports minus the directories are in the back. Um, we, f we finished making the updates to the directory on Friday, so we just ran out of day. Um, so um, Rhonda and I will be printing and binding the phone book portion um, this week, and those, those should be ready next Sunday. So, okay, any others? Okay, please take a quiet moment and prepare your hearts and minds for worship. I know what I forgot, because it just occurred to me, one of the announcements I needed to make was a thank you. Thank you to all of you who sent me cards and texts and messages on my birthday this week. I very much appreciate it. And because I celebrated my birthday this week, that means this is the week that we celebrate the August birthdays and anniversaries. So let's do that. If you have a wedding anniversary in August, please raise your hand. Okay, the Krogmans, and... Nancy and um, Larry, sorry, geez, my brain is four steps ahead. Anybody else? Who? Tommy and Evelyn? Excellent. All right, I don't see any. So let's all wish them a congratulations and a happy anniversary. Well done. And August birthdays. I know Evelyn's is coming up quick. And Susie and Carolyn and Teresa. Miss Della, Eddie, yours is this month too? Excellent. All right. Who else? Oh, Carol? Tomorrow. All right. Wayne, will you lead us, please, sir? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, brothers and sisters. Happy birthday to you. Okay, now I invite you to stand as you are able. We begin with the brief order for confession and forgiveness on page 56. <clears throat> I 
We are gathered this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please take a moment to reflect on your personal sins as we lay them at the foot of the cross. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us. Renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our entrance hymn is number 469, Lord of All Hopefulness.
God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty, eternal God, your kindness is far more than we desire or deserve. Generously pour out your mercy to forgive where our conscience is afraid and to provide that for which by ourselves we do not even presume to pray. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Who do I have this morning for the children's message? Excellent. <clears throat> Loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Sing it. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Good morning. How y'all doing? Did you have a good week? Excellent. All right, I need your help. Will you please tell me what a word means? What does it mean to be gentle? Soft what? Soft, okay. Careful, okay. Have you heard that word before, Reese? Have you heard be gentle? Where did you hear that word? I bet I know where it was. I'll bet it was when, when you first met your baby sister, huh? I bet, I bet mom and dad said be gentle, right? Something like that. Have you heard that word before, Lila? Is it hard to be gentle? Kind of? All right, let's try this. I'm going to ask you to give me five and don't be gentle. Give me five and don't be gentle. Go ahead. Hard. You can do better than that. Come on. There you go. All right. Give me five hard. There you go. Ah. I asked for that. All right, Grayson, you think you can outdo that? I'm going to switch hands. You, you missed. Try again. Try again. Try again. Okay. Okay. I need a second. You guys are getting too strong for me to do that. All right. Let's try again, and this time be gentle. Be gentle. All right. Can, can you do that gentle? All right. Very good. That was much more pleasant. Oh, one finger. Excellent. Okay. So that's how to physically be gentle. So if I told you... To talk to someone and be gentle, how would you do that? 
softly, okay? What kind of words would you use? Would you use mean words? Would you use strong words? Would you use nice words? Oh, okay. So we're going to hear a lesson this morning where Paul is telling his church, the church he started, that as Christians we need to be gentle. Okay. Another word you might hear if you read an older Bible. Anybody know? What's the other word? Meek. Right? Meek. We, with, when we're talking with our brothers and sisters in the church, right, those who are also followers of Jesus, we are to be gentle with each other, okay? And that's a good, that's a good rule of thumb anyway, okay? We, we can be gentle with people, right? It's a good way that we can show how Christ treated his friends, by being gentle, okay? Let's pray about that. Will you, will you make your prayer hands and pray with me? Close your eyes. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving us so much that you would take on all of our sins and pay for them yourself. Thank you for being gentle with us and showing us that God's love is gentle too. Uh, please help us to remember this lesson and help us to carry it outside the walls of this church that we might show the world around us what your love is like. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. All right. Madison, you got bags for us? Excellent. Thank you for coming to see me. First reading comes from the 16th chapter of Exodus. The whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepared what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumbled against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you're grumbling against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine, flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? 
for they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The word of the Lord. We will now sing responsibly by whole verse, Psalm 145. may know of your power and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. The Lord is faithful in all his words and merciful in all his deeds. second reading comes from the fourth chapter of Ephesians. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, And he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried away by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. The 
the word of the Lord. Hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Every four years, something monumental happens that captures the attention of a great deal of the world. And this Sunday, I'm not talking about the presidential election. Now I'm talking about the Olympics. The original Olympic Games were held in Olympia, Greece, starting in the 8th century B.C. That's how far back it goes. Those games lasted until the 4th century A.D., and they took a pretty long hiatus, about 1,500 years, and then started back up again with what we now know as the modern Olympic Games, the first of those being held in Athens, Greece, in 1896. Now, since then, these gatherings every four years have been an opportunity for countries around the world to gather in friendly competition, for nations to show off their best athletes, to put aside political rivalries and just focus on the athletics. These modern games have shown us what the human body can truly be capable of, how excellence can be achieved by hard work, focus, and dedication. Because it takes more than just luck to be an Olympic athlete. Raise your hand if you're bothered by the opening ceremony of this year's Olympics Games. Yeah. Yeah, the country that chose to host the Games this year (sighs) generated some controversy. Typically, the country that's chosen to host will put together an opening ceremony that showcases the history and culture of its people. Some of the opening ceremonies I've seen on the times that I've watched them, I don't always watch them, some of them have allowed me to see things about those countries I wouldn't have otherwise been exposed to. 
traditional clothing, perhaps, um, some of that country's music, historic figures from that country's history. Normally, it's something that the host country can be proud of, and it's supposed to be. <sighs> this one, so if you didn't see it, a small part, not this is not the whole thing, but a small part of the 2024 Olympic opening ceremony was a scene depicting 13 people sitting at a long table all on one side facing the camera, right? And the person in the middle had something like a halo around her head. Gee, what could that have been? Hmm. Christians immediately recognized this as a mockery of the Last Supper, right? That's what we saw? Okay. Those at the table were replacing Christ's apostles with men who identify and dress as women. And the person in the middle with the halo on her head, obviously in the place where Jesus would normally be, was a lesbian woman. Many were quick to tell us Christians, that's not the Last Supper. You're just making this about yourselves. No, no, no. This was a celebration of the Greek god Dionysus, the god of wine and festivals. The, the Olympics was a Greek celebration. This is a Greek thing. It's not about you Christians. Let me see if I get this right. These are the same people who are offended by maple syrup and quick rice. And they're telling us Christians we have no right to be offended. They call the U.S. flag offensive. American citizens call their own flag offensive. And Christians aren't allowed to be offended by a mockery of one of the most sacred moments in our story. Well, this is what we call gaslighting, okay? Have you heard that term before, gaslighting? Okay, this is gaslighting. Don't believe what your eyes tell you, they say. So let's dismantle this gaslighting, okay? Isn't it funny that they didn't even mention that while this was going on, also on the stage was a golden calf. Gee, what does a golden calf represent? Oh yeah, that's a pagan idol. That is the idol that got God's people in trouble many times in this part of our book, right? Because they worshiped it as a false god. It represented the most common and most prolific false god of the Old Testament, the false god Baal. Now after the controversy began, I think almost within 24 hours if I'm not mistaken, one Olympic spokesperson admitted that, well, the artistic director did indeed take inspiration from Leonardo da Vinci's famous painting of the Last Supper to create this setting. Oh, so there is a connection to the Last Supper, okay. If there's still any doubt, that creative director titled this section of the opening ceremony, I'm not gonna try to pronounce the French, I don't speak French, but translated it, it is, the Last Supper on stage at the River Seine. Its title is The Last Supper. Not to mention that the woman who sat in the center of the table in Jesus' seat, she posted this with the title, Isn't This Great? The Gay New Testament. Don't let anyone tell you this wasn't a mockery of The Last Supper. It absolutely was, and it was intentional. And when they got caught, they wanted to deflect from it. Now, I'm always quick to tell people that offense is never given. It's always taken. It's a choice, okay? I still believe that. And as Christians, I'm telling you, I think it's very appropriate to choose to be offended by this. I have made that choice myself. I am offended by this. But being offended doesn't really accomplish anything, does it? It doesn't. It just makes me angry. So what do we do about that? What do we do with this being offended, being angry? Well, let's take a look at what the lessons for today tell us. First thing they tell us is why this is offensive, okay? In the gospel reading, Jesus tells us that he is the bread of life, right? He is the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the whole world. 
And then, as we will remember shortly, on the night of his arrest, Jesus sat at a table with 12 of his closest followers, and he gave them bread and declared it to be his body, which is given for them and for all of us. This is the bread, the same bread we're about to receive this morning. When we do, we will remember that very scene, that holy last supper before his crucifixion. We will take part in that very same meal, the meal in which Christ himself comes to each of us more closely than any of us will ever encounter him until the day of judgment. This is the good news for Christians and for the whole world. And it is a testament to God's grace and his amazing and unending love for us. So no, I don't particularly like it being mocked. I hope you don't either. But again, my being offended doesn't accomplish anything other than just getting me riled up. So what am I supposed to do? I think the answer to that is, at least in part, in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. In this morning's lesson, Paul is telling Christians how Christians are supposed to behave. He begins by saying that he's a prisoner for the Lord. He is indeed writing this letter while sitting in a prison. And he got there by putting his faith on the line, speaking truth to power, no matter the consequences. And it wasn't the first time. You know, Paul was actually stoned and survived it. Paul puts his faith on the line. This time it just landed him in jail. Now, he doesn't say this, I'm a prisoner of the Lord, as some kind of a, you better do what I say because I'm in prison because of all you. No, that's not his purpose. And he's not looking for sympathy. He is simply stating his faithfulness to the Lord. Perhaps as an example for his church to follow. And then once the audience is aware of the lengths Paul's faithfulness will go, he then urges them to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Right? To walk, of course, means how we live our lives, right? Not terribly ancient lingo. So this is Paul's instruction for the church he helped to start, but it's also timeless instruction and it's useful for all of us. He says our lives should be worthy. The Greek word is axios. You heard that word before? Axios. Worthy of our calling as Christians. Now, this is the beginning of chapter 4. There are only six chapters in Ephesians, so this begins the second half. The first half, the first three chapters, which we've actually been dabbling in the last few weeks, we need to remember what those were about, okay? So let's take a step back. I found a, a New Testament scholar named John Corson who gives a pretty good summary of those chapters. He says, Paul told us that we were adopted into God's family, Elected before the foundation of the world, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and sealed with the Holy Spirit, all while we were still dead in our sin. If you want to say that another way that applies to this morning's reading, you might say before telling us how we are to walk, Paul reminds us we must first understand where we sit. And this is where so many Christians often stumble. They try to walk before they sit. Sermons are preached, seminars are given, books are published on how husbands should love their wives and the way wives should submit to their husbands. Or maybe it's the way we should live in purity. There might be a book on that. Or what we should do as a church body. And all these things take place without first acknowledging what God has already done for us all without factoring in the truth that there's nothing we can do to make God love us any more than he loves us right now. That's where we sit. Recalling, then, all that God has done for us and acknowledging all that, all that he has blessed us with, 
Now let's reread verses two and three again. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. First thing I want to point out there is that when he says one another, Paul is speaking within the church, okay, within the body of Christ, how we are to treat other members of Christ's church. And this becomes glaringly evident as, as we read the rest of chapter 4. The calling to which we have been called. Well, verse 4 tells us what that is. One body, the body of Christ. Well, the body of Christ is his church. The Greek word for calling is klesis. And that is the root word, or the root of the word ecclesia. Ecclesia, literally translated as the called assembly. That's the Greek word for church. So to be a member of Christ's called assembly is responding to a call. Remember Luther's explanation of the third article of the creed? It's the only one I ever quote up here, right? I believe I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and preserved me in true faith, just as he calls, gathers, enlightens and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and preserves it in union with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. So when you think of your own calling, and as Christians, this should be something you think about daily. What is my calling? What am I called to be doing? Remember that being part of the church is itself a calling. We are here this morning because the Holy Spirit has called and gathered us today. You responded to his call to gather for worship today. To be a member of his church means something to each of us. Member, membership is also a calling. Okay, so how then do we walk in a manner that's worthy of that membership, of that calling? Perhaps the first thing to acknowledge is that when we as members of his church do not walk in a worthy manner, we ourselves risk being the very ones to mock the Lord. How does it reflect on our faith or on the body of Christ when we conduct ourselves in an unchristian manner? It's certainly not God-pleasing. And if we call ourselves Christian, but then do not live according to Christian values and do not ourselves obey God's law, clearly we dishonor God. We actually mock God when we behave that way. So perhaps we, before we decide on what action to take on non-believers who mock God, we ought to take first a hard look at ourselves. You know, it's one of that take the log out of your own eye before you start complaining about the speck in your neighbor's eye. Yeah. Now Paul does give us some useful instruction on what our walk should look like in verses 2 and 3. With all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, in the bond of peace. Humility is first on the list. The way Paul uses this word, he means that just as we submit ourselves to Christ, as we humble ourselves before Christ, we should also submit ourselves to each other. We are not to be prideful or self-serving. We are to be exactly the opposite of that. Next comes gentleness or meekness. This is, quite frankly, the opposite of violence. Meek occurs often in the scriptures and refers to those who suffer wrong and commit themselves to God. When they suffer wrong, they don't respond with anger or violence. Instead, they turn to God for his guidance, his peace. Job was a great example of this. Third is patience. For those of you who grew up on the King James or the RSV, this word was long-suffering. Patience. 
Is that even a thing anymore? I mean, how long does it take the stupid microwave to heat up my tea? Right? Patience. No, it's not that kind of patience. What it means is before we react to something a neighbor does, we wait. We wait so that we don't act in some kind of hasty or emotional response. Maybe it's best to remember that when Paul defines love in 1 Corinthians, the first thing he says about it is what? Love is patient. Remember, love is patient, love is kind, right? Patient is the first one. So we can say that patience might ought to come before love. At least it precedes it, right? If we are to love our neighbor, we must, must be patient with them. Fourth comes, bearing with one another in love. Some translations say, put up with one another. I like the one that translates it, accept one another. And it's very important to remember the in love part of this sentence. That is the love which understands and has the high purpose of seeking to do what is best for the brother or sister who is at fault. These qualities that Paul describes for our walk serve a specific purpose. And that's the last part of this sentence. To maintain the unity of the Holy Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, unity here doesn't mean that every member of our church should be a carbon copy of everyone else. That's not unity, okay? If that's what unity was, we wouldn't need all these qualities to form unity because we'd all be the same. Let's not forget these qualities, this humility and gentleness and patience, right? Bearing with one another. These reflect also our worthiness, If we uphold these qualities and show ourselves to be worthy of our calling as Christians, then this kind of unity that Paul's bringing us to is possible. And then he describes what that unity is. One body and one spirit. One hope. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God and Father of all. The body, of course, is the church. He means the body of Christ. The body of Christ, which is called and gathered by the one Holy Spirit. One hope is the hope we accepted in our baptism, entering into that church, that one body of Christ, and receiving God's promises. One Lord, that's Christ. We are united to him in our one baptism. We submit to him when we seek to find him in word and sacrament, because he is the head of the one body, his church. One faith, the faith which is the gift of God given to us by the one Holy Spirit. One baptism, the sacrament which unites all of us, even the babies and the young ones who do not yet receive the Lord's Supper. Baptism is what unites all of us. And we look to the one God, the God who reveals himself to us as the Father over all in creation, He reveals himself as son through all and as spirit who is in all, the family of God. I read a scholar that calls this section of Paul's letter an early Christian creed, which was probably used in some of the first baptism ceremonies, and rightfully so. In baptism, we are joined to Christ and to his church. And we are called to receive the change that comes with that baptism. We're called to walk differently from the rest of the world. That's the worthy manner. We're called to walk worthily. To join the one holy Christian church, the communion of saints, as you heard me say this morning. To do that, to join this church, carries with it the obligation of living as saints in Christian sanctification, Christians being made holy in our walk of faith. So while I did choose to be offended by the mockery of the Last Supper, it's clear that I have some work to do in my walk. 
But there's more to it than that, isn't there? Those in the world who hate God are no longer content to just push him out of the public eye. They've moved on well past that. And now it's open mockery. Okay? That's where the world is. So yeah, I think we do need to show the courage of Paul to stand up for God's truth and speak it in love, even when it's unpopular, even if it costs us something, even if it lands us in jail. I'm certain that won't be easy, and it definitely won't be easy to speak that truth in love, but that is our calling. We are not called to remain silent in the face of mockery. But unity in the church of Christ, I fully believe, is more important now than it has been for a very long time, at least in my lifetime, maybe for a century or two. We need not spend time arguing over styles of worship or which translation of the Bible is the best, whether we're sprinkling or dunking for baptism. Silly stuff. We don't need to argue about that. For those who call Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior and those who believe that the word of God is the highest authority, we need to be standing shoulder to shoulder with each other. When Christians come together across the dividing fences of their denominational allegiances, one scholar says, they find they have more in common than they suspected and it is those commonalities that we should be focused on. But then... I also believe that unity starts at home. If there are differences or conflict in our own house, we need to be putting them aside. And that takes work. It takes effort. It doesn't come naturally. We will have to embrace humility, gentleness, patience, accepting one another in love. If we work on that, if we work on that, then we can do the same with our other Christian brothers and sisters who don't call themselves Lutheran, and we can build the unity in the big body of Christ that Paul describes. And then we can deal with the mockery of the non-believers. But I suspect by then it won't be worth worrying about because we'll just have too much to celebrate. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Mighty God, strengthen strengthen us as your church so we may obey your will. Keep all shepherds faithful to your word so they may speak your truth to the flocks to which they have sent them. Inspire the church to a greater commitment to the mission of the gospel in this land and around the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, you have made us stewards of your world, but only you can equip your people for ministry with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Pour out upon us your many and varied gifts. By the power of the Holy Spirit, help us to use them so our daily work and all we do may be to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, you are our ever-present help in troubled times. Surround with your protecting care all those whose duty requires them to face dangerous situations for the sake of others. Uphold our police and military, fire and rescue personnel, frontline responders, and others who need the shield of your strength. When the work which they must do is done, return them safely to their homes. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you care tenderly for all who suffer the ailments of old age, illness or injury of the body, and wounds to the mind and spirit. Be present to all who have any need of your healing, especially for everyone on our prayer list, those we name now in our hearts, those only known to you. Comfort them with your compassion as they wait upon you for their healing and help. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with all the pastors in the North American Lutheran Church and those who are working to become pastors. Bless Bishop Dan and his staff, Dean Steve, Pastor Todd, Pastor Nelson, Pastor Henry, Vicar Rebecca, and all the clergy in the Carolinas Mission Region. Guide them in their ministry, strengthen them to do your work, and protect them from all evil. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, be with our brothers and sisters whose congregations are discerning the call for a new pastor, especially Mount Calvary, New Covenant, and Grace Lutheran Churches. Assure them of your Holy Spirit's presence throughout the call process and guide us to be good neighbors to them during their transition. Bless their interim pastors as they lead them through this season of change. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abundant mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share that peace with your neighbor. Peace be with you.
Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. We Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth. In mercy for our fallen world, you gave your only Son, that all those who believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks to you for the salvation you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us, in his holy supper. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come, for all is now ready, the gifts of God for the people of God.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Thank the Lord and sing his praise. Tell everyone what he has done. Let all who seek the Lord rejoice and proudly bear his name. He recalls his promises and leads his people forth in joy. With shouts of thanksgiving, alleluia, alleluia. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. And we pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 320, O God, our help in ages past. <laughs>